Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this uh, webinar from my home office here in Southern California. Thank you for joining us on this uh, joint Teledyne and MarTech webinar to feature the latest in unmanned surface vehicles and hydrographic surveying. We appreciate everyone taking the opportunity to join us to demonstrate the possibilities of this technology for remote operations, especially in situations like the one we find ourselves in today during this ongoing pandemic. My name is Jeff Dean. I'm the USLA Sales Manager for Teledyne Keras, and I'll be your host for this session. I will be joined today by a number of people involved in putting this event together and who you will be hearing from shortly. We have Tom Hansen, who is the Chief Operating Officer for Marine Tactical Systems, MARTAC, in Florida. Rob O'Malley, who is the Technical Business Development Officer for Teledyne Marine. Also joining us is Rich Inda, Field Service Engineer for Teledyne Marine. And from Teledyne Optech, we have Gaspar Lima, the Product Manager for Terrestrial Products, here to speak about our Optech LiDAR solution. He's joining us from Ontario. In the field in Florida, we are joined by Sean Murphy, Business Unit Manager for Subsurface Operations for MarTech, and Jeff Cruz, Field Service Engineer for Teledyne Marine. And of course, myself, as I mentioned earlier, USA Sales Manager for Teledyne Keras. In addition to hosting, I'll be talking specifically about Teledyne Keras's onboard near real-time post-processing system. For the first part of this webinar, we prepared a few slides to provide an overview of the system being demonstrated. Following that, we'll have a live session showing the system in operation, conducting a survey in Black Creek down in Florida. And then, time permitting, uh, we will conclude by answering any questions. So there is a, a Q&A section in the GoToMeeting interface where you can submit any questions you might have as we present. Uh, we'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can in the allotted time. But in the case of any that we might not have the time to answer, we'll be providing feedback on those questions in a follow-up after the session. So the focus of this event is uh, demonstrating uh, that unmanned vehicles coupled with the right sensor payloads and automated real-time processing applications can be the right approach for nearshore surveys. That provides an alternative to traditional manned hydrographic survey operations. For our operation today, you can see we are in a confined waterway in South Florida with maximum water depth to about 25 feet. We've got a low bridge, some other hazards that are a good representation of where a complete autonomous solution that includes below and above water data collection is a more efficient and safe approach to these types of missions. The smaller, one second, I'll start my, restart my video. The smaller unmanned system here can get data coverage where larger manned survey vessels cannot the personnel required on site is lower and they can focus on the survey and data collection from a safe location nearby without having the other factors that come with larger manned vessels. This is just one scenario. I apologize, I'm having some uh, difficulties with my video playback, so we'll just move on. So this type of complete autonomous solution is suited to a variety of applications and use cases, with, whether that be civilian applications in survey engineering for coastal zone management, asset and infrastructure inspection or environmental applications, or in defense and security missions such as search and rescue, situational awareness and threat detection. In this case, we've selected the vessel and payload based on the best fit for our mission and environment, but the mission will ultimately drive the configuration. And that's flexible based on length of vessel, type of propulsion, and the number of types of sensors to be deployed. And this type of solution is ideally suited to missions that require near real-time data and information made possible by the automated data processing and output. So to go over our system components here, this configuration for this particular demonstration includes three main hardware components, including the Mantis T12 unmanned vessel fitted with a Resan CBAT T20 multi-beam for subsurface data collection, and the Optech CL360M LiDAR for surface scanning. On the software side, we have the Mantis command and control software for vessel control, the Teledyne PDS acquisition software for data collection from the sonar and LiDAR, and Keras on board providing the automated data processing, processing and near real-time data stream from all these components. 
This is the system we have on station in Black Creek being operated by Sean and that you'll see in action during the live portion coming up here shortly. So now we'll go into a little bit more detail on each of these components. So right now I'll hand over to Tom from MarTech to talk to you about the MarTech T12 platform. Tom? Yeah, hello everyone. Good morning uh, or afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, glad you can join us. Uh, what you see in front of you is the Mantis 12-foot uh, unmanned surface vessel. Um, it's, uh, it was 10 years in the making. It's a highly mature platform that's been in many military exercises. It's vetted at what's called a TRL-9 level. Um, this, uh, this platform was really is made to be very reliable. It's a daily tool, so a combination of high reliability and the most advanced technology that you'll find anywhere uh, in, in this uh, market. Um, this vessel you see is actually designed to be fully floodable as an example of how robust it is, although for survey applications, that's not necessarily, um, it's not necessary. Uh, however, it's a very, very reliable vessel. Um, it's easy to use. You'll see the what we call the tasker user interface as you go through the presentation. Uh, users can get up and running. They can usually drive the boat within a couple hours. And then, of course, more advanced piloting takes a little bit longer, but it, it's, a, it's a video game type of interface. Um, and more importantly for scanning, what you really have here, it's a catamaran hull, but it's a specially designed catamar catamaran hull that has a very smooth laminar flow, very self low self noise characteristics, very low vibration, very stable. And so we're able to get extremely high quality uh, results with the sonar uh, below the vessel. Um, it's not disturbed, they're not air bubbles. We get really, really great uh, uh, pictures and feedback. Um, and uh, as you'll see, we've concentrated a lot on real-time data feeds. We have a four-layer communication system that gives you both reliability and real-time um, data feeds back to shore, which you're going to be seeing. It's a worldwide communication network, so we can, we've uh, controlled these from Florida to Singapore to the Pacific Northwest. And finally, um, these vessels are actually designed with a swarm capability built into the control system so you can run multiple vessels if you need to, to, to uh, scan or, or cover more area you know, in a given amount of time. So that's the brief overview and uh, with that I will turn it back. All right, thanks Tom. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone on the call, uh, please use the Q&A section to submit any questions you have and we'll try to answer them at the end of the webinar. So now I will pass it over to Rob to go over the Resan T20 sonar. Rob? Rob, are you online? Seems like Rob is having some technical difficulties, so give him a second here to join in. Jeff, can you hear me? Got you now, Rob. Go ahead. Hey, sorry about that. Didn't even change anything. Not sure what happened. That's uh, technology these days, I guess, remotely. But luckily, everything's been working well for us here with this turnkey suite. Um, for the subsea survey portion, I'm proud to present the CVET T20 multi-beam echo sounder. Our T20 comes in three different configurations. We have a rack-mounted version, a subsea version, and a portable version shown here with our optional INS-20 uh, integrated on the system mounted to the bottom of the, the MarTech T12. Uh, so it's very flexible in terms of deployment and um, you know, our, sir, our engineers will attest to how quick it was, how easy it was to, to mount and integrate with the Man Mantis vehicle as well. Um, the configurable UI uh, is exceptional in the fact that it provides a number of options to the user so that it can be customized for any given survey. Uh, some of the features here um, include selectable beam density, uh, a number of different data formats to suit the acquisition and processing needs that you need for a given survey, and functions such as full water column backscatter uh, down to beam level data if needed and uh, can be really be a powerful tool um, especially given 
functions like our tracker feature, which allows you to set gates around the bottom, hold bottom lock based on our, our leading um, bottom detection algorithms. And, and these parameters allow for USB survey using multi-beam uh, really from a remote sense. So there's, there's this automatic uh, artificial intelligence, if you will, built into, into the sonar uh, head in order to allow for autonomous survey. And I think that's all I've got, Jeff. I'm gonna hand it, I think, to Gaspar here. Okay, thanks, Rob. So yeah, Gaspar will now talk about the CL360, Gaspar. Hello, thanks, Jeff. Okay, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to introduce you guys the CL360M. The CL360M is a 3D laser scanner designed to collect everything above the water level and extend the survey capabilities to combine the sea and the land for a complete data set. So it, it brings the marine grade version uh, of the CL360 sensor. Uh, it for robust and solid marine applications. So this sensor is rated as IP67 and designed for salt environment. Uh, it is also, it is a survey grade accuracy system. So for high requirement engineering projects. So we're talking about a sensor that has a capability of 10 millimeters range accuracy. And definitely it can expand your range of application with confidence in the results, right? It also uh, can scan up to 500,000 points per second and 200, up to 200, 50 lines per second for fast scanning. That's a half million points per second being shot into the structure or the seashore, super fast laser scanning for saving time in the field operations. It also carries a narrow beam divergence for small feature discrimination like cables, wires for clearance measurements, for instance, and any other small details in the structure, including even monitoring applications. It's a high resolution laser scanner. It also has a great coverage in terms of range, going up to 775 meters for incredible productivity, even uh, uh, when you're scanning from far away, right? So that's that's perfect for those shallow waters uh, that doesn't allow you to get too closer to the to the structure or whatever you want to scan. And finally, it also has it's capable to provide up to four returns for complex environments in vegetation penetration. So that's all I have for now, Jeff. All right, thanks, Gaspar. All right, so that covers the hardware section. So now we're gonna move on to uh, software side of things and into acquisition and processing. So I'm gonna hand it back to Rob to talk about Teledyne PDS acquisition software. Rob. Rob, uh, are you muted? Thanks, Jeff. Can you hear me? Gotcha. So I'm having some audio troubles today. Apologize, everyone. PDS is our application-based program designed to control, monitor, and record operations in real time. What's great about PDS is it's a one-stop shop for all the data collection. So it's agnostic for all of your sensors, all any sonar. Um, all of the data comes into this, this one software. It's highly user configurable in terms of a display, so you can control uh, the system components. Uh, you can set up the screen to see the parameters that you want, and you can watch the real-time uh, processing and collection of the data in 2D and in 3D environments, uh, which provides the ability for in-run QA, QC, um, which is really great for, for users to, to know during surveys that you know, they're collecting all the correct data that they want um, and you can have fidelity down to uh, you know, the deepest level of data available and to tune settings on the fly. Um, one of the best features, I think, um, coming together with, with PDS is, is the ability to do the different workflows and the water, uh, water flow of the, of the data into post-processing. Um, and for that, we have an exceptional software, Teledyne Keras, which uh, my next colleague is going to explain here. All right, thanks, Rob. 
so that moves on to Keras on board. I'll cover that portion of this webinar. So as you just seen, we, we have an unmanned vessel set up to collect data from multiple sensors. So Keras on board is the automation tool installed in the vessel that takes all that sensor data and runs it through automation routines to push out products to the remote observer or processor. And by automating data processing on the platform and using a web application to remotely monitor those results, we can improve data QC, we can reduce deployment times, and we can minimize any processing backlog. So during the initial setup of the system, the surveyor uses a process designer to customize an automated workflow specific to the sensor configuration and the desired product output. You can pre-configure things like what type of data is being imported. You can apply tides, do sound velocity corrections on through to what type of products are going to support your decision making and ongoing quality control checks. So that predefined workflow is going to provide you with consistent repeatable results across multiple platforms, sensors and configurations. So if you have you, you have efficiency gained in the workflow setup, but you're also going to be able to reduce risks and costs by remotely monitoring those results and being able to identify problems and correct them during the survey. Uh, Keras on board, uh, you can think of, I guess, as your single point of access to monitor your unmanned vessel or vessels in the case of having more than one system. So for example, if you have multiple unmanned systems working in tandem, onboard can be installed on each and that data reviewed together in one map view. So uh, I guess the best way to, to describe it is if you take a scenario that is typical of a traditional survey setup where you might have an online surveyor running the acquisition systems and then handing off the data, collect the data to a data processor who then begins the task of importing, correcting and analyzing that data. And in some cases that data processor might also be on board a mothership, for example, or uh, at a remote location away from the survey site and waiting for the survey launch to return after a day of survey. Now think of it from the point of view, if you imagine where you have, uh, you can introduce onboard to automate that process up to a pre-processed final product. And that can be viewed from the remote vessel in near real time. And I think you can easily see where you, you get the benefits there. So that essentially covers uh, the aspects of what we have going on now in Florida. So we're gonna switch over now to the live demonstration portion, which I'm pretty sure is what everyone is interested in seeing and give me one second to uh, cut into the live view and to start things over uh start things on on the live portion i'll turn it back over to tom uh, to talk about the command and control interface uh, that you see on screen right now tom yeah hi everyone <clears throat> tom hansen here from martech again what you're looking at is the user interface for the command and control system uh, for Mantis, which we call Tasker. Uh, in the upper left, the big quadrant in the upper left, that's the live mission map. Um, it's available, in, right now you're looking at an image. We also have charts. That um, blue triangle that says USB, if you can make it out on it, is the live feed uh, through GPS of the Mantis vessel. Um, the uh, large ring with the red star in the middle is a waypoint that's being set um, right now autonomously so the mantis is making its way to the uh, the waypoint uh, in, along a survey line in what we call a semi-autonomous mode uh, you're able to pre-program um, multiple waypoints as a complete mission and that includes the ability to run zipper or uh, mow the lawn type patterns where the mantis will automatically go through those lines in great accuracy and will align itself to each survey line. Um, the, we have a, a proprietary tracking algorithm that we often get within plus or minus one meter and often down to a couple feet off the path line, uh, which gives us really good coverage of, this, uh, of the uh, survey lines. Um, if you look, on the uh, in the kind of top middle, we operate in manual mode, which the operator can actually look at the vessel and operate it just like they would a, a you know a car or boat, um, or they're directly driving you know the props and the rudder and all that. But more often than not, they're going to be in, in a semi-autonomous mode. Right now, that he's in manual um, or an autonomous full mission mode in which there are multiple waypoints. So you, what you can see right now is he probably just heard me. And probably and set that waypoint, that big blue ring, and the mantis is going to go and uh, and scan along that line. Um, so that's kind of what you're looking at. And 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 finally, even though it's kind of small detail, right in the middle, you'll see the in the middle lower part 
There's a black area with kind of detail stuff. And um, right now we're distance the path. We're, well, we're a little bit far off the path, but it'll come in. And um, so you get full view of the whole scanning um, uh, terrain. And, uh, and with that, I will turn it back over. All right, thanks, Tom. So I'm gonna switch now to um, our acquisition and processing side. And I'll hand it over to Rich to walk through the Sonar user interface and the Teledyne PDS acquisition. Rich, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Um, I just wanted to kind of give a brief overview of the Sonar UI. Uh, the Sonar UI is the, the controller for the Sonar. <clears throat> So the benefit of the Sonar UI is it works for all of our uh, T-Series models. Um, so you can basically start the UI once, once it's communicating with the Sonar, it automatically detects what type of system it's using. Uh, for example, now that we have the T20 connected, um, it'll automatically configure for the T20 um, configuration. Um, excuse me. Uh, for example, if a, if a T50 is connected, it'll go and it'll detect what type of receiver it has connected and what type of projector it has connected, and it'll configure for that system. <clears throat> so what we're looking at here is the, the wedge uh, just to the left, and then to the right, you're looking at a side scan image, and to the bottom of the side scan image, image you're looking at backscatter data. Kind of want to go over the the uh, features that the um, Sonar has, because it's kind of important to uh, for, for the setup for the customer. Um, so what we got here uh, just below are the main controls. These are the basic controls where you got range, power, pulse length, and gain, and your ping rate. Uh, these are your standard, um, your standard uh, settings for the system. Um, you can uh, enable depth gates, you can enable range gates, uh, and adaptive gates. Uh, the adaptive gates are pretty nice because it'll actually automatically set your gates and follow the bottom for you, uh, which uh, cleans up your data quite quite a bit. Uh, we can go to the advanced tab. Okay, so kind of going through some of the features. Um, we have a, sorry, did that get reduced? Okay. So kind of going through the, um, why is that closing down in a second? Can you open up the advanced tab? Um, so going through some of the uh, beam mode options, um, we have equidistance, which basically means that each individual bathymetry point is equally spaced all the way across the swath, giving you a nice clean image um, throughout the throughout the whole swath. Um, if you switch the uh, the beam mode to the next mode. Yeah, Rich, I think um, I think we can probably move over to the PDS section right now. Uh, I just kind of want to go over some of the little features. I don't want to take up too much time on there. Um, so okay. the uh, so the next next uh, mode is intermediate mode and equal angle mode. They're per, <clears throat> they're both pretty similar uh, settings, uh, but what happens there is uh, you basically have uh, more beam density towards nadir. Um, towards later, but the benefit of running an intermediate mode and equal angle mode is it allows you to to steer the sonar an additional 20 degrees. Um, so if you're serving an embankment, a quay wall, or something like that, it allows you to get real close to the actual waterline without having to physically tilt the sonar head. 
Um, so that's that's one of the good benefits. It allows you to steer the beams um, and and get real close uh, real close to the waterline, as you can see there. Um, if we drop the beam mode down to uh, flex mode. Flex mode is a pretty good feature. Um, it's mainly used for like pipeline surveys. Um, so as you can see, um, where you see the two, the um, uh, the arrows uh, just to the bottom of the wedge, uh, you can see that we're concentrating concentrating uh, the majority of the beams on that section, but allowing uh, you know a percentage of beams to actually survey the the outsides of that section. Um, so, for example, if we were we were surveying a pipeline. And uh, right there, we can concentrate uh, the majority of the density on the pipeline, yet still have the dimetry on the on the outer beams. Um, as for uh, one of the good benefits of that is you can run a real time pipe tracker, and what it'll do is um, is it'll automatically steer the beam so it's staying directly above the uh, the pipeline. So, for example, if the surface vessel veers uh, off course, the uh, the, uh, the real-time pipe tracker will steer the beam so it's staying, uh, so the density is staying right above the pipeline. So it's kind of a new, uh, cool feature for that. Okay, so we'll go back into um, standard uh, equidistant mode. Okay, um, so the system can sweep between uh, 200 kilohertz and 400 kilohertz. Um, you can switch on the fly, so that's up to the customer what frequency uh, you'd like to run it at. Um, we also have it in FM mode and CW mode. Um, running in FM mode is great because you, you can run surveys up to 500 meters, um, and that's beneficial for, for, for a wide range of depth. Um, okay, and... Uh, We'll continue on. So, so one of the the, the best um, um, additions that, that we have is, is is tracker mode, which is basically like an autopilot mode. It uh, detects the bottom and automatically sets all your settings for you. Uh, it'll set the range, the power, the gain, um, all the necessary settings, and basically you can set tracker mode up and just let the sonar run by itself, uh, which is real beneficial because you can just pretty much set it and pretty much forget it and then go to your acquisition software and collect your data. Um, Rich, just in the interest of time, um, um, if we can move on to PDS, I think uh, yeah. we're, we're a little bit over time on this one. Yeah, let's go ahead and switch over to PDS. Okay, and PDS, what we're looking at here, um, we basically have the um, the vessel configuration for the POS MV, um, uh, the T20 sonar, and the, um, the, the laser scanner. Um, what you're looking at here is a 3D viewer um, of both the imagery from the multi-beam and from the scanner uh, at the same time. Which is real beneficial because it'll it'll allow you to see all the imagery in real time. Uh, if you look at the image to the bottom right, uh, you'll see a, a 2D version uh, image of just the, uh, the multi beam data. Um, in that screen, it'll allow you to put all your run lines. Um, you can set your uh, your charts and everything. Um, so you can basically run run your run your survey using that. Uh, just above that is the raw data. It's basically giving us all the information of each each uh, sensor. Uh, so if we lose if we lose something, we can go in there and we can see which which sensor is going out. Um, just behind that is, or just to the side of that, um, we have the the uh, the laser scanner uh, settings. So as you can see, that we can uh, we can change the uh, the degrees, um, the uh, the speed, the update rate, and the um, uh, the laser repetition rate. Okay. So as we're going right now, it looks like we're logging data. 
we're logging both the um, the multi-beam data and the scanner data. Um, the scanner data we're just we're just showing a, a history mode of uh, I believe 5,000 uh, 5,000 pings or 5,000 points. And so as we're collecting data after after that history mode, the uh, the data will start disappearing. Um, uh, we are, uh, as you can see, logging the uh, the multi-beam data, and that's actually staying in the grid model. <clears throat> so, as you can see, we've, we've gone underneath the bridge. You can see the um, um, the pilings and all the imagery on there. We didn't set up the uh, the multi-beam though. Should probably do that. Okay. Okay. So I think it. we can move on now to uh, the onboard section. Yes. All right. Thanks, Rich. Um, so as we've just seen, PDS is collecting the raw data, and just to make a distinction, Keras on board is taking that raw data and using that predefined workflow I talked about earlier, and it's creating the processed multi-beam and lidar data that is properly geo-referenced point cloud and corrected for sound velocity and vertical referencing. The real-time filtering can also be implied, such as higher pass or low pass filters on your sonar data or specific depth ranges as required by the survey. And there's a number of other different uh, filters you can apply depending on what your needs are. The control center for onboard is essentially a web page. You can see that uh, it's uh, right now we're running this in, uh, you've got a web address, we're running it in Firefox browser. Um, the web page allows the process products to be streamed to a remote operator, allowing the remote real-time quality control from the unmanned survey vessel. It's essentially a website. It gets streamed off the vessel and allows multiple people, multiple people to log in and see this data in real time without interfering with the survey operations. In the same manner where we have the participants of this webinar viewing our survey in real time, the onboard stream can be provided to anyone with a browser that needs to have access and view the progress and results of the ongoing survey. Now, this is uh, one aspect of it. If we want to take this a step further, if we can switch over and show you our desktop application. Um, now we're looking at the process geo-reference point cloud in the desktop application, allowing us to do further quality control and analysis on the data. In this case, you're opening up the process data set coming from the onboard project files. So it's it's not an image of what the what you're seeing in the um, uh, in the web browser application. You're actually getting the actual data. You have the same real-time visibility as in the web interface, but with more powerful visualization tools available in the, in the desktop Keras application. So now you can perform more advanced analysis on the integrated sonar and LiDAR data. So in essence, what Keras on board is doing is giving you a complete and processed data set that you can potentially deliver to your client straight off the vessel. So if you can imagine, I'm sitting here as the project manager or party chief in my living room in Southern California. I've just reviewed the survey completed in South Florida. It looks good. I'm going to sign off on it, send it to the client, and now I'm off to the beach where all I have to worry about is social distancing guidelines, of course. So uh, that concludes our uh, live part of the demonstration. I'm going to switch back now, and we're going to cover, uh, do a little bit of a summary and start going into the Q&A. So apart from my sunset beach excursion I just talked about, so what are the benefits of this type of solution? Uh, we have a flexible platform that can be integrated with a variety of components that can provide both above and below the waterline data collection. It can effectively minimize your operational costs, considering that you have a smaller and more efficient vessel, less personnel required to run missions, real-time verification of the data coverage and quality of the data being collected, meaning you can avoid the need to revisit the site because of missed coverage or quality issues. And you also have an easily scalable solution whereby you can add multiple vessels in swarm deployments using similar setup parameters for automated collection and processing. Can, you can quickly expand your coverage area with the sensor data from all vessels included in a single application to monitor all gathered data. So now finally, we are uh, coming up on the end of the webinar. So just in time, so we're going to uh, Going out to a few questions, I see we had some questions come in through the uh, interface. Um, the first question I think goes to Gaspar. Uh, the question is, is there a minimum range for the CL360M? Gaspar? 
Hey Jeff. Hi. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. There is a minimum range for 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 this specific sensor, and it is 1.5 meters. So of course we can uh, uh, using PDS or or others other data acquisition software, you can stipulate some range gate uh, different from that. But by by design, the sensor uh, has a limitation of minimum distance 1.5 meters. Thanks for the question. Okay, and I have another question that also goes to you, Gaspar, on the LiDAR again. Is Can the LiDAR also be used on other platforms like a land vehicle or a drone? Oh, good question. Yes, so the CL360 uh, 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 sensor was actually designed to be a, a very versatile uh, to have this versatile use, right? So this this M version was designed for marine, but the, even though you can take it off from the vessel, put uh, it on a drone, for instance, or you know even in a backpack or a, a, a mobile land vehicle platform, and just run with the same PDS software here, or even uh, a, 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 any other data acquisition software, and yeah, collect the data on by, even by foot, right? Okay. Uh, next question we have comes to Tom, uh, and this is for the vessel. What is the runtime of the USB used in this demo? Uh, the runtime, I'm assuming uh, by that question you mean the endurance. So um, depending on uh, what you're running, anywhere from you know six to twelve hours. Um, if you're asking an endurance question. I believe that was what the intent of the question was, yeah. Uh, so just a quick note, uh, we got a couple of questions coming in. If, if there's a question for a particular speaker or product, if you could uh, indicate which one of those, uh, what the question is directed to, that'd be appreciated. Um, now I'm going to, it seems like we're getting a lot of questions on the LiDAR. So another one for Gaspar, um, what's the weight of the CL360M? Sorry, Jeff, can you repeat that one? Question was, what was the weight, the physical weight of the CL360? Oh, the weight. Okay. okay, the physical weight, it's it's uh, only 3.3 .3 kilograms. So I need to convert this in pounds, sorry. Uh, but it would be something around seven pounds, I believe. Okay, so it's uh, for, for the American um, attendees here. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, that. That's why uh, it, this is one of the reasons that make this sensor so versatile, right? It was uh, designed to be a compact LiDAR. It's part of the compact LiDAR family uh, products from Teledyne Optech. Uh, and it's 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 being right now also being uh, applied uh, for, in some, you know, we have some partners, some integrate, integrators around the world, and they are actually also adding the CL360 version on drones. Uh, uh, because it, 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 this payload is very uh, attractive for this industry as well, in applications like that. All right, thanks. Thanks Gaspar. for the question again. Sure. Um, the next question is more to onboard, so I'll take that one. The question is, what is the security around streaming post-processed data in onboard over the internet to another location from a U.S. government perspective? Also a very good question. So uh, the security for onboard is is essentially set up by your own uh, company uh, and your IT department, uh, whether that be your your government requirements or your your own IT uh, requirements. So for example, if you have a secure VPN, then onboard traffic will only travel within that connection and not externally. And uh, Gaspar, you're really popular today. So uh, the next question is. Um, what's the wavelength and laser classification for the lidar sensor okay good um okay so the wavelength of the, the cl3 cxam is um 1550 nanometers which is classified as an eye safety laser uh, so it's um completely safe for for operations you know even when the when the laser is, is is on and you are around the system you know dealing with the installations or or configurations so even if if the laser is 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 actually shooting laser beams in the air it's completely safer for for the human being okay good uh, I have uh, one more question. We're coming up on the end of it. I have one more question that just came in. Um, it was, uh, I think, directed to Rob. It says, what is the swath coverage of the T20 sonar? Uh, 
Thanks for that, Jeff. Thanks for the question. Um, our the T20 here has a uh, swath width, swath coverage of 140 degrees. Uh, you get roughly about 12 times the water depth uh, in a dual head configuration. So here we're running in a single, but uh, as I mentioned, there's a number of configurable options with the T20, and uh, it is possible to run dual heads here, which would uh, allow you to, to cover quite a bit of the of the survey area, um, even in shallow water like we're in here. All right. Uh, so I think that uh, I think we'll stop for the questions there again. Um, Anything that we didn't answer, we got a, we got a lot of activity going on in the um, in the webcast, but um, we'll answer those questions by following up after this. Uh, so I just want to talk real quick about the video. So the video you're seeing here, this is some of the video of uh, we took earlier of the mantis going under the bridge, um, and this is exactly what you saw on the live demo just shortly, where they were surveying just off to the right on the uh, video that you see here. So. Um, again, um, we've got uh, contact information and emails for most of the presenters on screen and, and points of contacts. If you wanted to reach out directly to us with uh, specific questions, we'd be happy to give you that feedback. But uh, I think that concludes the webinar for today. So again, I do want to thank all our presenters and everyone involved in making this event possible, and especially everyone that took the time to join us. Um, like I said, again, we will be following up with this with uh, direct answers to questions that we didn't have time to answer here. And uh, we'd like to say thank you on behalf of everyone at Teledyne and Martak and have a good day.